if I see one more black female <laughs> supporting Trump, I'm a motherfucking know something. Cause why the fuck as a black woman are you supporting that shit? Imagine what can be and be unburdened by what has been. You know? You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> I knew you motherfuckers wouldn't listen to me if I just talked in a regular tone to you. So let me give you some more real shit, black woman. You don't need a confession for the down the black man. You don't need that. I've seen it on the motherfucking app every day. So you mean to tell me Donald Trump had a confession? From the Central Park Five, and he wasn't supposed to say shit. With all the power and the money, you'll tell him he ain't doing shit if he don't do shit. But he wasn't supposed to say shit with confessions. Donald Trump ain't no motherfucking lawyer. He ain't no judge, no DA. Don't bring his fucking name up when it comes down to some criminal justice shit. He just got into politics eight years ago. Let's stop the fucking madness. Let's stop the fucking madness, bro. Black woman, you don't need half of that information for the condemn a black man. Say I'm fucking lying. Say I'm lying. I don't witness y'all get on this bitch calling black men bullet bags. Ain't nobody gonna say this shit but me. And I don't give a fuck about what you feel. You heard me? Ain't nobody gonna say this but me. Stop bringing up the Central Park Five if you done already did it to the hundreds of millions of black men out here. Sign them up for death soon as they get hit. Jonathan Majors. Chris Brown. I done seen you hang, niggas. Stop. They say black people are not being targeted. They say that all of this harm that's currently coming to us is self-inflicted. Well, here it is. Another 18-year-old boy has been found in a tree in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Some say that the, that the officials are saying that it's self-inflicted, but in the article that I read, it said that an autopsy has not been done yet. So you can't confirm if it's self-inflicted without an autopsy being done. The other thing that's kind of scary is that it was across the street from a elementary school, Thames Elementary School in Mississippi. What is the world coming to? What is the world coming to? I cannot believe this many young boys are killing themselves. I feel like they're being targeted. I feel like the people in Mississippi and North Carolina, you guys need to walk in groups. Don't be alone. You know what I'm saying? Don't isolate yourself. Because right now, something is, something is not right. The full story is not out, but something is not right. I will not believe that another 18-year-old has hung themselves. It's just not adding up. But get the word out. You know what I'm saying? Hattiesburg, Mississippi, get the word out to your people. Walk in groups. Something is going on. You guys might be targeted. You might not. But better safe than sorry. Hey, everybody. Professor Moore here. So whenever I'm teaching an American history course, the lynching of black Americans is one of the darkest and most upsetting chapters that I cover. It's almost impossible to imagine or comprehend the level of depravity and violence that was involved in these killings. And I honestly believe that when you bring an accurate discussion of lynching into the American story, you'll never be able to look at American history the same again. In order to have a factual and accurate discussion of lynching with my students, I've spent years researching lynchings, and I've read hundreds of accounts of lynchings from historical newspaper databases, and I would like to share some of the conclusions I found from my research with you. So, lynching describes the illegal murder of black Americans by white mobs. There was no justice, no judge, no jury, no trial. This was public murder. But what were the reasons that the lynchers gave for these killings? How did they justify themselves? What were the supposed crimes that these black Americans were being killed for? Now, during the time period, the lynchers often made the false accusation 
that they were killing an individual because they had assaulted a white woman. However, anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells did her own research and found that this was completely false and that in the majority of lynching cases, the only crime that the black individual had committed was being black in a white supremacist society. However, protecting white women continued to be a popular explanation for lynchings. For example, Caleb Gadley was lynched in Kentucky in 1894 for walking behind the wife of his white employer. Keith Bowen was lynched in Mississippi in 1889 for accidentally entering and then leaving a room where three white women were. General Lee was lynched in South Carolina in 1904 for knocking on the door of a white woman's house. Thomas Miles was lynched in 1912 for inviting a white woman to go have a drink with him. Jeff Brown was lynched in 1916 for accidentally bumping into a white girl as he ran to catch a train. Parks Banks was lynched in Mississippi in 1922 for having the picture of a white woman in his possession. In 1889 in Loudoun, Virginia, a black 14-year-old named Orion Anderson was lynched by a mob of white men. What was his crime? He was playing with a white girl and he put on a mask and he scared her and he was killed for it. In 1930, John Wilkins was lynched for smiling at a white woman on a train. Sometimes lynchings were the result of a black American breaking some unwritten white supremacist rule. For example, Jesse Thornton was lynched in Alabama in 1949 for not saying Mr. as he talked to a white police officer. Some of the other reasons for lynchings were speaking disrespectfully to white people, arguing with a white person, insulting a white person, refusing to step off of the sidewalk to make way for a white person, or just standing around. It's clear that there never was any real crime associated with lynching. The crime that these people were being killed for was the crime of having black skin. So the next question becomes, who were the lynchers? And you might be surprised to learn that it was not racist terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, those groups did kill black Americans, but they were not responsible for the majority of lynchings. So who were the lynchers? The lynchers were doctors, teachers, grocers, businessmen, lawyers, parents, children, police officers. It was the entire community that was participating in these killings. There was nowhere to turn for help. You couldn't go to the authorities because the police officers were participating in the lynching. You can see from this photograph, the caption reads, Lynching in action. State troopers and citizens of Gordonsville, Virginia, formed a posse of 1,000, which fired for six hours on the cabin of a 65-year-old Negro worker and his sister. They finally burned the hovel and both victims. It's ironic that when the bodies of lynching victims were brought to the morgue, they often wrote under cause of death, death at the hands of persons unknown. But that is a complete lie. They knew exactly whose hands had done it because it was the entire community. Just look at these mug shots from individuals that were involved in a lynching in South Carolina in 1947. All of the men in this picture participated in that lynching and not a single individual was charged with a crime. Here's another article from 1943. The headline reads, these men might ordinarily pass for decent citizens. However, all of these individuals had recently taken part in a lynching. And when people were asked to describe what these men were like, here's what they said. These are some of the best men in the county. Men who are considered here to be the best representatives in the community of law, order, and justice. They called these men good Christians. They called them the best citizens. The lynchers were not seen as monsters, but upstanding members of the community. They were not treated as pariahs or social outcasts because everyone in the community was participating in these killings. 
The next point to emphasize is that lynchings were not spontaneous acts of violence that were committed in a fit of rage. These were organized, planned events that were attended by thousands of people. Usually a lynching victim was kept for a few days, sometimes in a jail cell or held in another location, and this gave the lynchers time to advertise the event. You can see here from this newspaper ad, the date, the time, the location of lynchings was widely distributed in order for more people to come and participate in this killing. And sometimes people drove across state lines. They would travel hundreds of miles in order to watch these murders take place. Lynchings were usually held on weekends, so more people could attend. However, if they were held on a weekday, all of the businesses would close down so their employees could go watch the lynching, and all of the schools would also close down. They would ring the bells, and all of the students would walk out in a single file, and their teachers and parents would take them to these lynchings. And when they got there, they would hear musicians playing music, and they would find vendors selling snacks and drinks. Now, these lynchings were not done under the cover of dark in the middle of the woods. They were done in public, in broad daylight, in the middle of Main Street, on the public square, sometimes even on the courthouse lawn. Now, if you look at this photograph, you would never know that these people are going to a lynching. These individuals are flocking to go watch a public murder take place in broad daylight in America. If you look at this photograph, you would never know that what these individuals are all straining to see is a lynching, the killing of a black American. If you were to look at this photograph with no context, it looks like a carnival or a concert, and that is exactly the type of atmosphere that lynchings had. People were not ashamed to take part and to watch these lynchings. These were nights that these individuals wanted to remember. That's why usually during all lynchings, there were professional photographers that were taking pictures of the killings and turning them into postcards. And they were also taking pictures of individuals that were there that wanted to commemorate and remember this night. If you look at this picture and you see the faces of these individuals, it's very hard to imagine that just right off the screen, are three young black teenagers that have been brutally killed. This is a picture of a lynching that took place in Florida in 1935. And this is a young girl watching an individual be killed right in front of her eyes. And I want you to look at her face and look at the smile on her face. The fact that a young girl could watch a black American be brutally killed right in front of her and then smile while looking at that dead body shows you just how much black Americans had been dehumanized. And it shows you how much white America was desensitized to this violence. To accurately tell the story of American history, this level of violence has to be brought back into the main narrative we are never going to be able to move forward as a nation or a people until we finally deal with the legacy of this violence. I wanna say this once again, family, if you see me put a white person in the compilation, that's because they said something that's on the level. This is not a cookout invite. I'll repeat, they're saying something that is on the level that can resonate with the family. It might add some more insight, not for a cookout invite, bars. Y'all, Freddie Owens has been executed because the governor decided he was not going to commute his sentence after his friend told that, hold on y'all, hold on. After his friend told that he lied on him just to get himself out of trouble, after the prosecutors went and said the DNA did not match, after everything that happened, the judge and the governor said no. Like, y'all can take innocent people's lives. Like, this man was innocent. And y'all literally just executed him. Like, for what reason? When it was a total lie. And it's like, the same people that are supposed to protect us are the same people that are hurting us. And I'm talking about us as our people because it ain't really happening to nobody else. 
it's only happening to us. And when I say us, y'all know what I mean when I say us. They literally took this man's life over a lot. And the same justice department and justice system and police forcing and all of these things can do whatever they want to do to us. And we got to sit back and be quiet. And I thought maybe the voices on social media and the numbers that were being called because there were a lot of people working in the background and they still did it. Like they still did it. Y'all know what to do. Get in the comments. I'm emotional because I just can't believe it. Like I really thought they were going to stay this man execution and they did not. Similar to what they did to our brother yesterday. Um, this is Wednesday, September 25th as I'm recording this. Um, brother Marcellus Williams. Yeah. This is the dominant society saying, hey, we still have power. We can still lynch you with impunity. We can still devastate your community with unjust, unnecessary criminal acts based on the, the letter of the law. Now it's up to us to stay steadfast and unmovable, to stay on code, to stay codified, keep pushing for reparations, anti-black hate crime bill, so we can build up our communities and we can have a financial system to help protect us. Like Jason Black says often, they hate you because you're black, but they persecute you because you're poor. You're not underqualified, you're just black. This is something I thought about because I recently just watched a documentary about MoviePass. Now, MoviePass was a successful startup started by two black men, um, but they were eventually moved from their position by two executive white men that took... Now, with these men taking over, the company led to bankruptcy, multiple fraud charges, and broken hopes and dreams. The original founders, Hamet Watt and Stacey Spikesman, told that they were underqualified, told they didn't necessarily fit the vision of where MoviePass was going. Mind you, these men had been serial entrepreneurs, having multiple businesses that led to exits, acquisitions, and even had been venture-backed. This reminds me of the saying, you have to do twice as much to get half as far. So now it makes me think, what do you have to do to get the other? Throughout history, we've seen ideas being taken and reclaimed by others without recognition of their originator. I think we see Lonnie Watts with the Super Soaker, or Garrett Morgan with the traffic light. Now, with this pattern, it makes me think, is black talent and innovation just placeholders until something better comes along? And if so, then why do we continue to input our cultural contributions into society? Finding out that less than 100 years ago, black folks were used like sandbags to protect white folks from flooding is probably one of the most heartbreaking things I've read in a while. In 1927, after months of heavy rains, the Mississippi River flooded, impacting thousands of families in Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Homes were submerged in 30 feet of water, 250 to 500 deaths were reported, and hundreds of thousands of people were displaced in what would be named one of the most destructive natural disasters in our history. But it's rarely talked about, especially the part about Black people being forced by Pew Pew to use their bodies to shore up levees at risk of failure, efforts that were applauded as brilliant, mind you. And we certainly don't hear the stories of Black refugees who reported slavery-like conditions at refugee camps set up by the Red Cross and U.S. government. Activist and journalist Ida B. Wells was one of the few who reported on what was happening during the months of recovery based on letters she received from Black refugees. They reported being forced to do labor for whites and unable to move freely in and out of camps. At least one Black man was injured by police in Greenville, Mississippi after he refused to do such labor. Black people slept on wet ground in poorly made camps alongside chickens, pigs, and cows, while whites were given housing in downtown apartments, the first pick of donated clothes, and better quality food. Guys, black people didn't have rights 60 years ago. 60. Like, black people did not have rights 60 years ago. I feel like a lot of people tend to forget that. Like, on my dad's birth certificate, it says Negro, not black. My granddad is from Mississippi and couldn't walk into the front door of a store that he went to all the time. He had to go through the back. Like, think about all the people you know over 60 years old. They were b born during a time where black people did not have rights. Black people were not looked at the same as every other human being. They were looked at as less than. And then people in today's society want to be like, well, y'all have rights now, so y'all should just shut up about them. Like, imagine that. 60 years is not a long time. It's not.
like, like people just forget that. And I just was talking to my family about that this morning. It was like 60 years ago. Insane. I'm gonna need you foreign women not to speak on black American women issues. This is gonna offend a lot of people, but I really don't care. One, you passport bros kill me. There was a, a lot of black men are in the comments of this German woman uh, her video that she made talking about, oh, it was, you know, black women don't want to compete for their men. It was easy. It's easy to take a black man away from a black American man away from a black American woman because they're just masculine to this and that. Here's my thing. And this is always what I say for all of you women that claim, oh, well, you all foreign women I'm talking about. Oh, it, I just always rested my femininity. It's easy to rest in your femininity when you were never, when you never had to be forced out of it. When you never had to grow up under the threat of graping, pillaging, uh, murder, all of that type of stuff, constant legitimate oppression, both internal and external. When you never had to deal with the trauma of slavery, when you never had to deal with any of the things that black women actually have to deal with from, and then try to date and move as if nothing has happened to you, you might just be more masculine. I guarantee you all of those foreign women that love bashing black women that love talking about how, Oh, black men are black men are, Oh, you have to treat them like Kings. And da, da, da. what you foreign women don't understand is that during slavery and after the emancipation of, 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 of slaves, the same black men y'all talking about, a lot of them were still in oppressive to black women that look just like them. This entire narrative about the black woman being masculine is always, it's spewed out of the mouth of people that just want some, that, that literally just want some crap to, to, to say. They just want somebody to bash. They just want to make themselves look better. If you have to bash the black woman, to make yourself look like a better pick church. You, you ain't, you ain't really, you ain't really worth a damn. You're not really worth it. And these black men, all these passport bros that, that try to uplift foreign women, they uplifting y'all long enough to screw you long enough to screw you and possibly knock you up because the, as far as I see the uh, marriage rate for black men is still standing at 34.6%. Marriage rate for black women is still sitting at 25%. So these black men that you want to call the kings and all this other crap, that still ain't getting no, still ain't getting no ring. It's still missing. Still not getting you a ring. It might get you knocked up at best. At best. But it ain't getting no ring put on your finger. You understand what I'm talking about? So please, foreign women, shut up about black American women's issues. Shut up about them being masculine. Because you've never had to understand, you don't understand why they have to move the way that they do. And you damn sure don't understand why black men are really elevating you. It's all a game. It's all a rules. They're only uplifting you to piss the black woman off. Because deep down, there's a lot of unhealed childhood trauma that a lot of black men suffer and deal with. That they don't want to speak on. Because most of them, their daddy was gone. Most of them, their daddy left. So the only thing they can do, they can't, they don't want to blame their mama, even though psychologically, subconsciously, that is what they're doing. So they don't take out the anger at their father and their mama. They take out the anger at their daddy on other women that they deal with. And well, my daddy wasn't shit, so I ain't got to be shit. This is why I'm very, very glad that I come from the family that I come from. Very, very glad. When you, con when you constantly practice dysfunction and then you try to uplift other people that never ever had to walk in your shoes, you create this thing called a fractured narrative. And that, a fractured narrative, is like giving half the facts and trying to understand why you ain't got the full story. You dig? Judge. You bring an accurate discussion of lynching into the American story, you'll never be able to look at American history the same again. I knew this history was bad. I... I didn't know the scale that's uh, described in this video. Obviously, go watch it. Uh, sorry, he didn't enable stitches, so I downloaded it. His uh, username will be listed. Obviously, there's a lot to cover in this video, and I only want to add a small but significant tidbit. Watch this clip on the reasons for these horrific actions. Protecting white women continue to be a popular explanation for lynchings. For example, Caleb Gadley was lynched in Kentucky in 1894 for walking behind the wife of his white employer. Keith Bowen was lynched in Mississippi in 1889 for accidentally entering and then leaving a room where three white women were. And then they organized this? ...are going to a lynching. These individuals are flocking to go watch a public murder take place in broad daylight in America. If you look at this photograph, you would never know 
that what these individuals are all straining to see is a lynching, the killing of a black American. And about it all, they said this. The date, the time, the location of lynchings was widely distributed in order for more people to come and participate in this killing. Let's unpack this language. Governor Bilbo says he is powerless to prevent it. Thousands of people are flocking into Ellsville to attend the event. Sheriff and authorities are powerless to prevent it. After the abolition of slavery, as Union troops continued across the Confederacy, they freed slaves as they went. Famously, Juneteenth is celebrated as basically the last of the freed slaves. What you don't know is after the fall of the Confederacy, Texas expanded slavery as it was far out of the reach of the Union soldiers. And it took a very, very long time. In fact, years after the abolishment of slavery for the Union troops to finally make it over to that last uh, place holding out to release the slaves there. Around the time of lynchings in the Reconstruction and Jim Crow South, this was in living memory. They knew that the federal government could probably help with this situation. There is precedent of the federal government coming through and freeing slaves. All of those abolitionists from the Civil War, a lot of them were still alive. All of those northerners that helped escaped slaves find freedom, they were still alive. There was plenty of help to call for. They weren't powerless to do anything about it. Aside from the fact that they were directly involved, they had plenty of options, even if they truly felt like they couldn't do it. Very often when you hear the words, I'm powerless in society, it's not because the person claiming that is truly powerless to act. It's because whatever is being asked of them is against their ideology. And deep down, very often they want that thing to happen. Or they believe that if it's a bad thing, that the people who get it are going to deserve it. It wouldn't have taken much. Letters to sympathetic parties. Hey, I'm a sheriff here. We have this epidemic of black people being blamed for menial uh, issues and being lynched over it. We can't solve the problem on our own. Couldn't even do that. So if people back then were capable of horrific actions on the flimsiest of justifications, what makes you think that they aren't capable of similar bullshit today? If they were willing to collect thousands of people to watch a man be murdered over a smile... What makes you think they're not willing to, I don't know, deny somebody a job because the dude's black? Oh man, that was over a hundred years ago. This is a picture of a lynching that took place in Florida in 1935. And this is a young girl watching an individual be killed right in front of her eyes. And I want you to look at her face and look at the smile on her face. The fact that a young girl could watch a black American be brutally killed right in front of her and then smile while looking at that dead body shows you just how much black Americans had been dehumanized. And it shows you how much white America was desensitized to this violence. This person is probably the grandmother of somebody living today. Probably the grandmother of a handful of people. She and those tens of thousands of other people, probably hundreds of thousands of other people in the South, have raised their children into the same ideals, who have gone on to raise their children into the same ideals, who are currently the people that hold the most power in the United States today. Lynchings continue in America to this day. And all of you claiming like, oh, there's laws and civil rights movement and all that sort of thing. Like, dude, that was not the reckoning that America needed. 
with slavery. We still haven't actually got that moment. Germany's radical turnaround in regards to Jewish people was because they lost a world fucking war. And until something that extreme happens to us and the people overseeing our reconstruction don't botch it like they did post-Civil War and actually squash the attitudes through education and laws and enforcement of those laws, the problem of racism in the United States will never go away. But what do I know? I'm just a moose. You see a man get shot and killed almost by the NYPD just a few steps from where we are. And it did not need to happen. We were told that you'll see a video of this man lunging at officers. That doesn't happen. At all. No. Not at all. We were told that these officers feared for their lives. That's not the case. That's not the case. You'll see Mr. Del Pesce minding his business in that train car, being directed away by an officer to a place where he cannot exit. There's one entrance and one exit to this train station. He attempts to leave the area and these officers open fire, hitting him in the back of the head. This is a mass shooting That's right. inside of our subway system. Four people shot. That's a mass shooting at the hands of the NYPD. It never should have happened. 100% that my dad is not, in fact, Native American at all. In fact, he is 100% white. Um, and so am I, unfortunately. So uh, I confronted my dad about this. He continued to lie. And I confronted Audrey about it. I emailed her and told him that he misrepresented himself. And uh, her response back to me was, leave me out of your family drama. So then I find out that not only did my dad fake being Native and is in a documentary, and the documentary was on PBS, played for an entire month of November. Um, so many, many, many folks saw it. Not only did my dad do that, but he also stole from the government $12.5 million by pretending to be a Native American. Um, he, in the documentary, says that he's Ho-Chunk Winnebago. Well, guess what? I'm just a chunky ho. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm not going to stop with that because it's just too good. It's just too true, you know? It's true. I am a chunky ho. Pipe down. That's our slang. Why don't you use something from your region? <laughs> So, that guy that many have called the freeway runner is me. Uh, I'm on break, and I figured, why not give you guys a story time and let you know what was going through my mind when that happened. So, at the time when Eureka called me, I was taking a five-hour exam. Uh, I'm in medical school. It was in preparation for my medical boards, which is a nine-hour exam. When she called me, she was very much in shock, couldn't really spit out full sentences. Um, all I knew was she was on the highway, she totaled her car, that's it. I don't know if anybody has ever gotten a call like that before, but my heart like sunk to the, to the pits of whatever. So immediately my instincts kicked in and I just told her, I'm on my way. Don't worry about it, I'm on my way. When I said that, she said, you're not gonna be able to get to me because the highway's backed up for miles, so just stay on. So in my head, I'm Mr. Find a way or make a way. So I told her, don't worry about me. I will find a way to you. So I immediately stopped what I was doing, hopped in my car, put her location into my GPS because we share each other's location. And I drove as fast as I could. Not say I was abiding by any speed or traffic laws. So as I was getting closer to her location, I was realizing she was not lying. This highway is backed up for miles. Uh, there's no way of me getting onto the highway. There's no way of me cutting through all that traffic to get into the shoulder of the highway so I could drive to her. So I parked my car the nearest spot and got to running. So then I proceeded to jump over the barricades on the side and run for what was probably about 1.5 to 2 miles. 
I was a 400 meter hurdler, so all my preparation had led up to that point. And so as I'm running and getting closer to her, I'm seeing a fire truck in the distance and I see like a mangled car. So at that point, my heart dropped even more than what it was. And I didn't see an ambulance. So then I started to get worried, like, are they not giving her medical attention? What's going on? Me being the healthcare provider I am, I'm like, OK, I'm going through all the things in my head that I would have to do to provide medical care to her if she's hurt. When I finally made it to her, I gave her the biggest hug ever. Like, it was such a sigh of relief not seeing her in a stretcher or in something. She was standing. She was okay. And uh, the first item on my list was just to check her and make sure she was okay. So then I asked her if the firefighters had checked her, if they had examined her body uh, for any bruises or anything, because she could have internal bleeding. She said nobody had checked her. So then I examined her, checked her limbs, torso, head. Uh, all the places where vital organs are, see if there was any bruises uh, that could be a sign of internal bleeding. I didn't see anything, didn't find anything that would suggest any type of fractures or bruises or anything, so she was okay. Um, and I knew it was God. I think the moral of the story is that when something like that happens, you start to really understand how much you love that person. I didn't care where I was, what I was doing, how I had to get to her, or if it was two miles or a marathon that I had to run, I was gonna find my way to her. After looking at her car, I had quickly realized that she should not be here. And the fact that she is and is injury free is nothing but the grace of God. If you've made it to the end of this video and you want to continue to show her how much God truly does love her, um, she's still saving for a car, but if you'd like to bless her, I will put that info down in the description. Thank you, guys.